everyday English listening. Topic 1. Thai Island Life So I'm here in uh, Bangkok with Jerry, and she is Thai. And uh, Jerry, I thought we would talk about Thai islands. Of so course. there are some major islands. Can you first talk about the major uh, uh, resort islands in Thailand? Yes. Uh, so as most of you know, Thailand is probably v- visited because of its islands. So the most um, well-known ones would be Phuket and Koh Samui, which are both down south in Surat Thani. And, yeah, I think those are, like, the main destinations. They have changed quite a lot um, since the last 10 years. Um, it's quite developed, so it's an island where, you know, if you really want, like, a very nice resort and um, have, like, a convenient list, like, malls everywhere. There's also, like, international schools, so a lot of people now move to live to Phuket or Koh Samui. It's like a little Bangkok, but by the beach. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. And Phuket really, um, really uh, developed quickly after mm-hmm. the terrible tsunami, right? Mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. really rebounded, and now it's quite vibrant, yes, correct? Yes, 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 correct, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the both Samui and, and Phuket are the more traditional, maybe tourist package islands. Yes. Uh, are there some smaller islands or less known islands that you would recommend? Yes. Uh, there's a, we have a lot of islands in, in Thailand, but um, uh, just near Koh Samui, you have Koh Phangan, which is also known for its full moon party. That is, okay, the high season, but um, Koh Phangan is actually really nice. That like apart from the full moon, if you visit the the, the other less well known beach, which is um, Hat Rin, which is where the full moon party happens, uh, there's a lot of like hidden beaches that is very quiet, very relaxed, and it's still it's still not as developed as Koh Samui, so you still feel that like island lifestyle. Um, there's a lot of small businesses, local shops. Oh, that sounds nice. You know, I actually have not been to Gopangan, Mm -hmm. but I've been to Koh Tao, Mm -hmm. and that's the diving island, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Can you talk about that? Yes, of course. So Koh Tao is known for um, its crystal clear water and uh, corals um, for diving. So a lot of people go there to get their diving certificate. Uh, That's actually the best place to do it. And you can spend like three days there, do the course, and then the island itself is also... Um, it's quite remote, so there's like a few few stores, not as, not as much as in uh, Koh Phangan, but yeah, it's nice and quiet. And oh, that's mm-hmm. beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's some other ones too, right? So there's Go Chang. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that? Yes, uh, Ko Chang is closer to Bangkok, so you can drive there. It takes about five hours. It's in Thrat Province. Um, Ko Chang is a big, big island, and. Uh, yeah, there's a lot, some people like it, some people don't because it's less uh, vibrant, I would say, compared to like Koh Samui or Phuket. Um, but there's a lot of like big resorts there, and the beach is also really beautiful. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have to confess, it's my favorite island yeah, by yeah, far. Yeah. <laughs> so I first went there uh, 25 years ago, mm-hmm. and it was really quiet then. I mm. mean, incredibly quiet. And the movie came out, The Beach. Right. And I remember when I saw that movie, I'm like, oh, that's Go Chang. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. it was, there was nothing to do on the island. Yeah, and so yeah, that's, yeah. it's beautiful. It's a national yeah. park, correct? Yes, yes correct. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another little one near Bangkok called Go Samet, right. correct? Yes. yes. Um, that's a very popular one, especially for Thais to go during the weekend. Um, it's like a two hours drive from Bangkok in Chonburi province. And yeah, all you, all you do is you drive there and then you take a quick boat uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, to. It's also a national park, so there's entrance fee, um, but it's, it's really nice. You have the beaches are smaller, but there's like different beaches. And uh, a recommended activity would be just to rent a bike. And then, yeah, drive around the island. It takes about, like, half a day. But different, um, all the beaches have their own unique character, which is nice to see. Oh, mm-hmm. that's so awesome. Actually, when I was there years ago, I don't think they had the road around the island. Yeah. But I remember they had, it was just amazing, beautiful beaches. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's two more uh, that are quite famous, uh, or one that's very famous, and that's GoPP. That's way down in the south. Mm-hmm. And there's also Golanta, which is not too far away, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about those? Yes. Um, these two I haven't visited. I don't remember visiting them, but I know like a lot of people go there for its clear water and um, called Pee Pee. I uh, I believe has the 
the well-known like sand in the middle of the the ocean that you can walk across one island to the other and it's known for like you know taking a boat and the water is like very clear and Kalanta um yeah Kalanta I think it's also yeah known for the same reason as called pee pee um yeah for its crystal clear water and there's like beautiful resorts there too mm-hmm. great okay so I'm gonna put you on the spot if you had to choose one island to visit, recommend one place. Where would you go? Kopangan. Kopangan. Without thinking, yes. Absolutely, really? Absolutely, yes. And why? Um, it's always, it's a place that feels like home to me because my mom is there as well. So uh, we, know, we know the locals, which makes a difference. Like it's, um, And also, I think the island hasn't, you know, it's not, it's not developed, but it's also... It's, there's also like things to see, and you really feel like you're on holiday. You really feel like you're going on an adventure. Oh I'm man, I think I want to go there right now. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I have a week, and I'm like, I'm gonna go to Thailand. Topic two: Island stress. So I'm here with Jerry, and she is from Thailand, and we're talking about islands. So these islands in Thailand get a lot of tourists. Yes, right. Thailand mm-hmm. probably gets more tourists to its islands than any other country in mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. How is there like uh, any concerns about the environment or development on the islands? Yes, of course. So wheres ever, wherever there are people, there's always an effect on the environment. Um, and you see this a lot, especially on the most visited islands such as Phuket and Samui, um, with the development of condominiums, schools, malls, leads you know deforestation, of course, and more pollution. Um, you also see the effects more on like the more uh, the more vulnerable islands, like the smaller islands, um, such as uh, I think like called PP or Koh Lanta. Um, they, they all of the islands used to be like full of uh, trees and used to be like national um, national parks, and now like with the people taking speedboats and everything, you really see the oils on the sea. Um, the coral reefs um, are not as colorful as they should be. All the plastic that comes with, you know, getting food boxes, plastic straws. Yeah. And you really see, like, uh, the ecosystem in the, the sea mm-hmm, are affected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really tough. That's a problem that we have to solve everywhere in the world, mm. it seems like, especially mm-hmm. the plastic. Mm. Um, do you know about Easter Island in Chile, you know, the, with the big um, stone statues? Mm. No, not so much. No. Okay. Uh, I'll just hang on. I'll just say that. I'll just leave right. it in another yeah, way. Good. Yeah, that reminds me of Easter Island, which is, you know, famous in Chile for its really mm-hmm. large stone monuments, like the stone faces. And they couldn't figure out how the people disappeared or why they disappeared. And now they think it's because they cut down all the trees. Oh, wow. And after they cut down all the trees, that basically destroyed the mm-hmm. environment and the mm-hmm. people couldn't survive anymore. So they had to leave the island. Mm-hmm. So... Mm-hmm. Islands really are vulnerable, especially with their trees, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons I really like Go Chang. Yeah, yeah. Because you can only develop on one side of the road. Yeah. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. so there's a road around the island, and if it's on the beach side, you can develop, but anything inland on the other mm-hmm. side of the road, there's pretty much no development. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, but there are also, like, uh, on the positive side, you see, you know, when there. There are things like bad things like happening to the environment. You see like innovation, people actually coming up with ideas. So a lot of uh, hotel uh, hotel chains, for example, are becoming more sustainable. They're incorporating uh, metro straws, paper straws. So you do see like some changes, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, a great point. Like eventually business can find a solution. Yeah. It's yeah, in their best always, interest, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm. that's really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so what about the economy? So uh, I guess the biggest jobs are the resorts? Yes. Yeah, so the Thai economy relies on tourists. Um, uh, the Yeah, like we the hotels, the restaurants. That's where we get our money flowing, I would say. <laughs> right. So that's where you get the uh, uh, capital influx from other countries. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you live in Bangkok. Uh, mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, how often do you get to a resort or to the beach? More than I should, to be honest. Like, uh, 
I love the island, so every opportunity I get, I'll fly down south and then visit the different ones. But yeah, as I mentioned, my favorite one would be called Pangan. Um, yeah. Can you fly directly from Bangkok to Go Pangan? Yes. Uh, so, well, not directly, but you can fly to the mainland, which is Surat Thani. And it's actually nice just to spend a day there because Surat Thani, um, you get a, you, you, there's like a culture there and then you get to try the, the authentic southern food before you actually go to the islands and it becomes a little bit more like western, you know, with the taste and everything. Um, so that's my recommendation. And then the next day you can just go to the, the pier and take a ferry to the, the, the different islands you want to go to. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. So I I definitely, definitely want to take your advice. (laughs) Thank you. Cool. That's really nice. Topic three, Bangkok transportation, part one. Okay. So I'm here with Jerry and we are in Bangkok, Thailand, and she's Thai. And uh, I thought we would talk about the interesting transportation systems of Bangkok. Yes, very Bangkok, interesting. <laughs> yeah, Bangkok has so many ways to get around. So mm-hmm. the most common, of course, is the BTS, right. which is the over rail train, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. then there's the mm-hmm. MRT. Mm-hmm. Okay, can you talk about them? Yeah, so these two are the new forms of transportation in Thailand. Well, not so new. I think about 10 years now we've been having them. Um, but they're probably the most common way to travel into the city. Um, the SkyTrain station is now expanding quite fast, so it's going to like other parts that are outside of Bangkok for the outer cities, uh, from people from the outer city to travel into the main business, business district areas. Um, yeah, and the price range from 30, 35 baht to like 100 baht, depending on how many stops you have to take. But it's becoming more and more popular, and so the rush hour is quite it gets quite hectic. I think it can be regulated a little bit better, um, but I think yeah, they're working on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I work in Tokyo and Bangkok both, and um, when I when I first came here, the trains were empty, mm-hmm. the BTS, and right. now they're like Tokyo. Yes. they're on the same level of packedness. Right. That's yes. crazy. Yes. Okay, so then how about the world famous? Um, Thai taxis and tuk-tuks. Okay, yes, for sure. Um, so I'll start with the tuk-tuks. Um, the tuk-tuks are probably the most interesting way to get around town. Um, you see them a lot in Bangkok because they attract tourists. Um, so you can get them. Yeah, they're usually... Uh, the thing to be careful is that there's not really a, a fixed price. So... Uh, you can get a little bit scammed, scammed yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I would recommend just asking the locals, like how how much would it cost, like from to get here to there, so you know, like a little bit about the price range. But if you're if you're here in Thailand for the first time, it's definitely the way to travel around. You get the wind in your face, and yeah, it's really nice. Um, and then the taxi meters are also there's more and more every day. Um, and yeah, it's 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 like. Um, and yeah, the country, I guess, it's air-conditioned, and then the meter starts from 35 Thai baht. Mm-hmm. It's true. It is like any other country, but I would say they're very unique in their colors. Oh, so right, the, yeah. They have yes, the yes. very beautiful technicolor that mm-hmm. you only see in Thailand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it goes from pink, green, bright yellow, and they're all very and bright. orange, so, correct, yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, they look so beautiful, actually. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Actually, going back to the tuk-tuks, mm-hmm. one thing that I think is interesting is, obviously, they're used for tourists, mm-hmm. but also... Local ties, I see, use them kind of to transport a lot of bags and stuff. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. like, if they need to move a bunch of stuff, like yes. bags, or they need, like, I don't know, supplies for a restaurant or something like that, you'll right. see tuk-tuks yeah, moving absolutely. things around. Yes, yes. And there's, like, different si- different tuk-tuk sizes. So some of them are, are more for, like, transportation, as you mentioned. And then we have more of, like, the bigger... Uh, similar to Tuk Tuk's, they're called Song Tows, which you see in like the small little streets in certain neighborhoods that people need, just need to get to the main road. Okay, now can you describe what a Song Tow looks like? Yes, absolutely. It's like a truck, but with a big open <laughs> area in the back for people to hold on to the rails. So, yeah, I'm not sure if you can imagine the picture, but in a Tuk Tuk, hey, you get to sit, it fits about three yeah. people max. But Song Tow, the back, uh, the open air area fits about 20 people. Topic 4. 
Bangkok Transportation, Part 2. Another famous thing about Bangkok mm -hmm. is the motorcycle taxis, mm -hmm. which really freak a lot of the tourists out. I'm sure, like they're I'm sure. afraid to get on one. <laughs> Can you explain the motorcycle taxis, which are incredibly common? Absolutely. So, yeah, it can get quite, it's quite scary, but it's probably the fastest and most uh, cost-effective way to get around Bangkok, especially during the rush hour. Um, motorbike tax, you know, there's like a lot of motorbike taxis in Bangkok, and there are different stations, so you can get them at the at uh, right below the SkyTrain station mostly, and yeah, they know the streets very well. Um, they know the 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 fastest routes to get to your destination. And once you get familiar with it, it's actually not too bad as long as you ask for a helmet. I always think that 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 is because it does get quite scary on the main roads with like yeah, a lot of <laughs> women a lot of times sit in a very dangerous position yeah, because yeah. of their skirt. They'll sit sideways. They yeah. don't sit with both legs mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. with one leg on each side mm -hmm, of the motorcycle, mm -hmm. which I always find incredibly <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. Do you ever sit that way? I have to admit, yeah, most of the time I sit that way, and it's quite like you don't realize it yourself, but when people see it, they're quite fascinated. By it, like yeah. how we can balance ourselves, and yeah. then the motorbike is like swirling its way around. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing about the uh, maybe just explaining about the motorcycle taxis is so Bangkok has really long streets, mm -hmm. it's not a grid system, it's no. kind of like the roots of a tree, like the, the, the roads will just go forever right. in one direction. Yes. So basically, people take the, the main lines like the subway or overhead train to mm. their stop, and mm -hmm. then they take the motorcycle taxi to their home, correct? Yes, yes, correct. That's the most common way, yeah, to do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the mornings and in the evenings, it's amazing because it's like this fleet of motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, the whole street yeah, is just humming mm -hmm. with motorcycles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you you realize how popular they are when you're standing at the station and there's no motorbikes left because, you know, they're yeah. all being... Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, in your where you live, do you see the same motorcycle taxis every day? Yes, yes. Do you know uh, them by name? Um, yes. So, like, even the one in front of where I work, um, they're, like, familiar faces. They know where I live. And yeah. They take me home every day. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. so awesome. Mm -hmm. So, what about new things like Uber and Grab? Mm -hmm. So, it's causing quite uh, a bit of tension in, in Bangkok. Um, as expected, uh you know, the motorcycle taxis and the normal taxis are not so happy about th uh, this. Um, but, yeah, I think um, with the election coming up, a lot of parties are trying to regulate it a little better because currently the main problem is that the Ubers and the Grab drivers are not legal to have passengers. They don't have the license. So that's the main issue where why the motorbike taxis are and the, the normal taxi drivers are quite fed up about. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, one thing's for sure, it's very easy to get around this city. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Topic 5, Bangkok Shopping. Uh, so I'm here with Jerry, and she's Thai, and we are in Bangkok, and uh, we are going to talk about fashion. So, uh, Jerry, Bangkok is a very, very fashion-conscious city. Yes, absolutely. Shopping mm -hmm. is huge here. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about prices. So first, we'll talk about jeans. Um, you are wearing jeans today. So how much are an expensive pair of jeans in Bangkok? Well, that's funny that you asked because the price range for uh, clothes here is quite wide. So you can go from 200 baht, Thai baht, for a pair of jeans up to 4,000 Thai baht for a pair of jeans in a, like, a, a, like one of the top brands. Wow. And so just so people know, 200 baht would be, in U.S. dollars, that's about $6.00. And four thousand baht would be about one hundred and thirty dollars. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So it's quite a quite a difference there. Yeah. Um, but I would say that um, generally it will be in the range of five hundred to two thousand Thai baht. Okay. Five hundred to two thousand. That's still pretty a wide gap. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So those are jeans. What about uh, for women? A blouse. A blouse. I would say. For, like, a, a nice quality one, like 500 Thai baht. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. yeah, $15 right. yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what's the most you would pay for a blouse? No more than 1,000 Thai baht. Okay. Yeah. That's your, that's, what about the cheapest? The cheapest, like, 
300 Thai baht. Like, if you start going lower than 300 Thai baht, then you have to ex- accept that the you know the qual- you might get to wear it not more than three times. Okay. So that's the price you pay. <laughs> nice. All right. So uh, what about shoes? Shoes. Uh, it it also depends on where you go. So Chatuchak Market is known for affordable clothes. So the shoes there would be from 200 Thai baht to 500 Thai baht. But if you visit um, the more well-known stores in the department stores, then they can be from 500 Thai baht to 1,000 Thai baht. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So you mentioned Jatu Jack Market. Can you kind of talk about Jatu Jack Market? Yes. So this is one of the main activities for tourists to do when they visit Bangkok. It's a weekend market, so it's only open on Saturdays and Sundays. It's quite crowded, but it's definitely something you should do. Um, there's a lot of souvenir stores, a lot of local shops, and, yeah, a place to shop for clothes. Um, and it's not just for tourists. You also see a lot of Thais go there because all the stores there are reasonably reasonably priced and they're quite trendy um yeah they have like different styles uh stores that you won't find anywhere else right oh mm-hmm. yeah i've been there a couple times it's mm-hmm. massive it's really yeah, it's really massive. big it takes about half a day to to, to do the entire it? thing yeah yeah and it's like it's easy to get lost Minimum, right? right like if you yeah. go inside it's like you kind of don't know where exactly, you are exactly yeah. which i guess it's also the fun part of it it's like an adventure in itself right <laughs> right exactly okay cool thanks jerry you're welcome See how is that on time? Oh, that's a short one. Hang on, actually, I'm going to add a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so um, what about things like uh, like belts? Or, you know, like accessories. Mm -hmm. Um, I would recommend going to Platinum Mall. This mall is um, located near Siam BTS Station. It's it's known for its accessories that are, like, reasonably priced. Um, So at at Platinum Mall, accessories can be from 100 Thai baht to not more than 1,000 Thai baht. But usually in the range of 100 to 500 Thai baht. Okay. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. But there's a whole floor, like two floors that's dedicated to accessories. So you can find necklaces, sunglasses, rings, earrings, about 10 shops for, for each <laughs> category. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So Bangkok's quite interesting because it has so many different ways. You can buy things on the street. Yes. You can buy yeah. things at the markets. Mm-hmm. You can buy things at the nice air-conditioned malls. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about online? Do you tie shop online very much? Yeah, online online uh, shops are becoming more and more popular now because it's quite convenient. You just get it delivered to you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of more fashion brands that are online on Instagram, for example. Yeah, so it's becoming a thing. Oh, cool! <laughs> All right, thanks, Jerry. You're welcome. Cool. And then- Topic six: Kids and boredom. Like, did your kids work when they were in in school? How did you feel about your kids when they were in in high school? My kids had to work for the pocket money, so they would have chores to do, and they would get pocket money. Um, they would help with the washing up, sweeping, cleaning, whatever. They always had to earn their pocket money, which so they you... thought was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you ever withhold their wages? Yeah. You did really. Yeah. You'd be like, no, you didn't do your chores. You don't yeah, get the you're money. Not it. Yeah. Really? How often would you have to do that? Uh, more so in the in the beginning. Once they get the idea, you know, if you don't work for your money, you don't get your money, and that, that's a life lesson, isn't it? That you know, you is don't do your work, great. Because I, I think get money. I think a lot of people just assume, even me, like uh, I'm, I've never had children, but the parents just spoil the kids, and they just oh, they don't want to have the hassle. They don't want to have the fight. They just give them the money. But you look at the difference between the Western kids and the kids out here. You can go on a bus trip with the kids out here. You can go on a six-hour bus trip. You don't hear a peep out of that kid. They're sat there. The mum's asleep. Maybe the kids are asleep as well. If you put Western kids on a bus for six hours, you'd have to have a PlayStation or a, a tablet or something. They'd be crying. You'd have to feed them things. It's a totally different way of acting yeah and i i missed that like when i came to asia i noticed that the kids were happier with less much less than than we have and it wasn't until i spent the year in asia and then i went to australia landed in sydney noticed one thing that the people were that much bigger but also the kids were just so spoiled and the the, the parents were just giving in to them 
So you think that maybe we need to, to rectify that situation, that we should stop spoiling kids. Yeah, I do. Take away the PlayStation. Yeah. Just stick them outside. Yeah. You can get strollers today with um, a place where you can put the, the kid's tablet. Yeah, it's Why crazy. Why can't the kid just look at the world? Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned that because before we were talking about potential business ideas, mm. and I have an idea called Camp Boredom. So what boredom hap- is good. Yeah, what happens at Camp Boredom is you send your kid to Camp Boredom. It's like a, just a camp in the woods or on a farm, and the kids come, and they go, what do we do? And I go, I don't know, nothing. Go outside. Just find something to do. No Wi-Fi. Because, yeah, because I grew up, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. I grew up on a farm, and I'm, I'm really blessed. I had no idea how blessed I was at the mm-hmm. time. But I grew up, I spent all my time at my grandfather's farm, and we had nothing to do. I mean nothing, but we had this farm, like so we had everything to do. So the rule was you had to be up for breakfast at 7, and then once you finished breakfast, you had to be out of the house. Like you could not be in the house. It was almost forbidden to be in the house unless it's like raining outside. And you would be outside from you know sun up to sundown. Yeah, climbing fences, climbing trees, having the, haystacks. Right, having the best time of your life, yeah. and uh, your imagination is going, and you just... Oh, the little things that you would do. Oh, we're going to build a tree for it. Oh, we're going to do this. Oh, we're going to do that. We're going to stop the river from flowing. Right, right. <laughs> so that's my idea. I think camp boredom. So maybe we have to... I think boredom is good for kids. Yeah. How so? Because it, it, as you say, you know, if if they're always entertained and always fed, then they don't get to learn how to entertain themselves. Yeah. You know, if you sit sit them in a the car with nothing for six hours, right. you can't look out the window. <laughs> There was a great a thing recently where Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, he has a bit where he talks about how his mother would take him to the bank when he was like a kid. And like a bank or a department store was the ultimate space of boredom. Like there's nothing you can do. You know, like you're so bored, you just want to like flop down on, on the floor type of thing. But, but you're right. Like I don't know if kids have that anymore. No, they don't. Where they have like they hit that wall where there's nothing for them to do. No. You know? So do you think that maybe we should limit the, the the devices, the smartphones, all that that kids use? I do think you should, but I think it's too late now. I think, you know, we, we've passed the point where you can get Wi-Fi, Internet. You know, if we took all that off the kids now, you know, what what would they do? They'd be bored. But well, you can just never <laughs> give it to them, right? Yeah, in the first place. Maybe that's yeah. impossible. It's impossible. Okay, cool. <laughs> Topic 7, Family Money Flow. So I'm here with Angela, and we're talking about families, differences in family culture and structure. Um, One thing that I noticed, uh, I'm sorry, and we both have experience with the West. Actually, we're both Westerners, and we also have worked and lived in Thailand. Have you noticed a difference in the flow of money, which I think is quite interesting? So in a lot of Asian cultures, especially Thailand, the money, the flow of money goes from the children up. Yes. Whereas in the West, the flow of money goes from parents down. the parents down or the older the, the family member down. Yes. It's a completely different flow, which is quite interesting when you think about it. Isn't it? Because you know, a lot of the people that are working in Bangkok and some of the, the tourist places in Thailand, they send money home. They don't earn money for their own keep and their own life. They actually send money home to the villages to pay for their children, to pay for their mothers. And I think it affects the way that people respect people within the family. There's huge respect for older people in Thailand that I didn't notice in in the West. And I, I think maybe it may be something to do with the fact that they are still giving to their parents. Yeah, you know, that's so true. I think... Uh, also, the fact that the family is almost like a bank, yes, it's, and and they have a pool of wealth that they use together as a unit, which I think is a just a great concept. Yeah. Although when I say this, I don't kick money up to my mother. <laughs> so, but I'm always thinking, I wish my family did this. Our family in the West, we should ad- we should adopt this practice. You know, everybody gives ten percent to the pool to the family pool. Yes. But I, I don't know if it, it would it would ever work. I don't know if it would work, no. So I mean so you have kids. Yes. Um how would you feel if suddenly your 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 children started giving you ten percent of everything Great. they make? 
<laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? But it's not going to happen. Right. It's just not in our society. Yeah. But you wouldn't spend it though, right? Like the whole idea is like they just give it to the, like you would be the guardian. You would be the safekeeper of the money. Yeah, I'd, put, I'd probably have the money and then put the money away for them. Right. Because I think that the pressures in the West are different as well. You know, it's very hard now for people to become house owners. So for my kids, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get on the, the property ladder. So if they gave me any money, I would give it back to them as a deposit. Yeah, you know, although there is one other thing that goes the other way, which is uh, in Japan, uh, I hope I say this right, I think it's called a Toshidama. Basically, it's you get money from your relatives. If you're a child or a kid, you get money from your relatives on, on January 1st. They give you an envelope, and sometimes kids might get two, three, four thousand dollars mm-hmm. on New Year's, depending on how wealthy your family is. And I think there's Chinese New Year. Maybe they do something similar. The kids get money. I'm not sure. So there is the other flow where, where families do give kids money. I think. And also, I remember years ago when I first came to Thailand, I was talking with a guy, and I said, "Yeah, you know, one thing that's shocking about kids in Thailand is they don't." Nobody works. They don't have part-time jobs. Not that many have part-time jobs, although it's changed. I said, in America, you work, and it's a good thing. Like, you know, you, you, you build values. And he said, yeah, we know in Thailand they can't do that because if a child works, especially for a middle-class family, it's an embarrassment to the family. Like, the father can't provide for his children. His children have to work when they should be studying. So it's really interesting, the different dynamics and money across mm-hmm. cultures. Topic 8, Empty Nest. So I'm here with Angela, and she is a writer and a traveler, a teacher, a businesswoman, and you're also a mother. Yes. I and have twins. You have twins. That's amazing. Wow. And so you also are now what's called an empty nester. Can you explain what that means? It's the feeling that you get when you realize that you've worked hard for your kids all those years and now they're ready to leave. And because they're twins, the nest is going to be emptied completely at once. Yeah. And I would be in the house by myself. Um, I did think, though, that my son um, would have stayed home forever. So I would never have got to a position of having (laughs) an empty nest. And and, uh, my daughter, uh, she, she left a little bit earlier. But it was just the thought of, you know, you're in a house that your family's grown up in. You know, what do you do now? Do you take in lodges? Do you rent the house out? And that's when I made my decision to to travel. And it was a gap that I spotted because my kids were 18 at the time. It was likely that my daughter uh, would have grandchildren at some point, or I would have grandchildren, she'd have children. And then it would not be possible to come away again so I saw the gap Um, I rented the house out and my son who was the last to leave the house he said mum are you renting my room as well I said well of course I'm renting your room you know you don't get a house with a teenager resident in it and he was absolutely flummoxed but he he found somewhere to live He's, he's working she's found somewhere to live she's working and I think that that one of the things you can give your kids actually is independence I think it's the biggest thing that you can give them. Yeah, and back in the day, you know, it used to be that you would get kicked out of the nest. That was another phrase, you know. And you'd yes. say, like, okay, when you were 18, your parents would, you know, give you that push like a mother bird, go fly, mm. go go do your thing. And I think it's still a good thing, actually. I think it's a very good thing. You know, yeah. that you go out, you, you – know, I was not really kicked out, but I did leave right away. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a good experience. It was the best experience. You know, that those those years when you've got freedom, you've got your friends, you're growing up, you're learning about the world. You should be out there by yourself. Now, you um, are, you've done something uh, against the grain. You went and traveled by yourself um, mm-hmm. and your gap year. Now, in Asia, where we are, it's very, they're not, this isn't really an empty nester culture. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know if they, especially Thailand, they don't really push kids out of the house people stay and live a little bit more. Have you noticed a difference in like kind of the family dynamics now that you're in, in Bangkok? I think um, in Bangkok and Thailand and certainly the, the other 
Southeast Asian countries I've travelled, I've been amazed at how families operate and live together. I think I'm very saddened by um, my own circumstances in the UK and lots of people in the UK where families are divided and they don't live together and they don't support each other. When I was living in Isan, it was very obvious that families, because there's no um, social services, people have to work or they've got no money. So the, the parents would have to go to Bangkok or Phuket or one of the, the tourist areas and the children would be left with the grandparents in the village. So it was obvious that there were lots of children who were growing up with grandparents, aunties. But I looked at this and thought, well, these kids are living in a village where it's safe, they're happy, you know, they grew up as a, a gang, and, and they're loved. Yeah, that's really nice. It's interesting you mentioned that. One of the saddest things I ever saw unexpectedly was when I was in the Philippines. I was flying out. I was in the Philippines. I had a great time. And when I was going at the airport, they had this long line. And I didn't know what was going on. It was all these children and their mothers. I mean, we're talking dozens. And it just, it seemed strange. And then it hit me, oh, because the Philippines have so many people that work overseas. These were all mothers that were saying goodbye to their children. Yes. Because they had to go work overseas. And it's like, I only get choked up now, like, thinking about it. It was just really powerful that the, you know, like the people that had that situation, that those mothers, you know they don't want to leave their kid. Yeah. That's got to be but really hard. To. But they have to. They have they to have go to, to wherever they're going to go in the world. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was something. I'll never forget that. Yeah. I find families over here are just so willing to share. They share their food. They share their beds. They share, you know, they share their houses yeah. in a way that is just so, so different yeah. to what it I've is, experienced in the UK. That is true. That is true. Topic 9, Student Life in China, Part 1. So, Ruafei, you are from China, and in America, Chinese students have a reputation of being very hardworking. Is that true? Yes, exactly. Uh, in my high school, uh, in one class we have 70, around 70 students in one class, and uh, everybody wants to be the top students so everybody worked so hard and uh, I'd say my high school was kind of like a prison <laughs> you have to go to school every day from uh, 6.35 a.m. to 9.40 p.m. Really? Uh, that long? Yes. That's, that's over 12 hours that's like 13, 14 hours a day. Yes, exactly. Whoa. How did you feel as a student studying that much? Sleepy. I bet. Every day I'm so sleepy. I, I can imagine. Do you think it was productive, studying that much? Mm, I think uh, their purpose just allowed us to stay as much time as we can in the school and we cannot um, dis get distracted by other stuff. So... We always stay at school and we always focus on our studying. And uh, yeah, we kind of cannot know anything about the outside of the wall from school. That's amazing. So for such a long day, can you talk about the daily schedule? What was your schedule like every day? Uh, from um, 6.50, we start to have class from 6.50 until maybe 11.45. Yeah, we have uh, 45 minutes class and then 10 minutes break. And we also have 30 minutes we have to do exercise on the playground. And uh, in the afternoon is the same routine. And then we went to dinner around uh, 6 to 7 and uh, from 7 to 9 40 we have to do our homework oh so you study at school so it's not homework it's schoolwork. you don't actually go home right yeah oh that's crazy so how many classes would you have every day classes uh eight classes 
Okay. And what were the subjects? Um, we separate the subject. If you learn more、um, mathematics, we learn mathematics, English, and Chinese, and uh, uh, physics, chemistry, and uh, um, biology. That's yeah. That's very rigorous. Did you enjoy all the subjects? Yeah, I love I love physics and uh, uh, biology and、uh, chemistry. And now you are training to be a doctor. Yeah, that's fantastic. Did you know you wanted to be a doctor when you were in high school? I kind of know because my father is a doctor. Okay. And、uh, he was kind of forcing me to start the medicine. Oh, nice! So we have a, a phrase in English. We say "follow in your father's footsteps."、Uh -huh. So you definitely are following in your father's、yeah. footsteps. Oh, that's great! Is your mother a doctor?、Uh, I'm. My mother is a businesswoman now. Okay.、Mm. Oh, great!、Um, so you had all these courses. Now in America, there's a big controversy about tests. That kids take too many tests.、Mm -hmm. It's too test driven. What about in China? Do you have a lot of tests? Yeah, I have test every month, and they will,、um, they will make a list of、uh, every single person how much score you got、oh, in、whoa. this test. So they rank everybody to you, see. Yes, that's very competitive. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of bad for our emotion. Yeah, so it creates a lot of stress. Yeah. We have two、uh, thousand students in one grade. That is crazy. And so you can be number two thousand. You can be the lowest student. Yes. And they put that out there. Yes. <laughs> really?、Mm. Oh my! They can never do that in America. Yeah, I think so. Oh my gosh! Do you think that's a good idea? Um, depends on the person. Right. Yeah. Wow. So. You have a lot of pressure. Did you feel pressure from your parents, from your peers, from your teachers? Yeah. Like who gave you the most pressure? Myself. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be lazy. I don't want to be、um, worse. So I have to always work hard to chasing other people. Everybody wants to be the best. So everybody work really, really hard. Even we have breaking time, they don't break at all. <laughs> Seriously? Yes. What do they do during the break? They do questions. Wow! They quiz each other. The students quiz each other, or they just do homework. They do their homework and、uh, they find out what problem they've had and they solve the problem with teachers or other students. They just starting all day. They can do that. That's amazing, and kids do this like fourteen, fifteen hours a day. Yeah. Wow, that's really good for China. <laughs> and、uh, we don't have that much summer vacation and winter vacation. In winter vacation, we have two weeks because of the Chinese New Year. It's about two week stuff. So we have two weeks in winter vacation and one week summer vacation only. Is that enough? Of course not. <laughs> And、uh, even we have vacation, the teacher would、uh, give us a lot of homework to do. That is very impressive. That is very not good experience. <laughs> wow. Well, actually, okay. We'll talk about that in the next interview. I think that's a very interesting point.、Mm -hmm. Topic ten: Student life in China, Part Two. So, Ruofei, you said that your education system is very strict,、mm -hmm. and you study like fifteen hours a day. Yes. Okay, so if you were in charge, would you keep the system the same way? It depends on the person.、Uh, I think there should be a place that.、Uh, As strict as my high school, and、um, and、um, you can choose to send your children to go there, or, or 
if the students themselves they want to go to that school, they can go. I think that's really really motivative to students to study hard because everybody do the same and they are trying their best to do to be the best. Well, wow. yeah, we have a phrase in English like a rising tide lifts all boats, and I think it's kind of the same, right? So if it's really rigorous for ev for most people, it's going to pull everybody up. Yes. Okay. Um, it, there's nothing you would change. Like if you were in charge, like would you give maybe a little more vacation time? Would you start the day later? Would you make classes smaller? If I can choose, I would definitely. Don't choose my school because that's that was horrible for me because I need a lot of sleep than normal people, but I cannot have that much time to sleep,、oh, so、right. I always sleep on the class, and、uh, when somebody found out that I I'm sleeping on the class, they will、mm, decrease the score of my class. Oh, that's serious. Yes, very serious and.、Uh, Yeah, and uh, your um, teacher would punish you to write a paper like "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I decreased the score of our class. I shouldn't sleep on the class, and、uh, I have to write it for like、uh, one hour to write that stuff." That is very harsh. Yeah, I think though a lot of people when they hear stories like that, they actually. Are a little bit envious, especially parents or teachers,、mm -hmm. because in the rest of the world, it's not that students don't try that hard. Yeah. So that's kind of special, actually. Yeah, I think that's yeah. I think that's the special point of China. Wow. So,、uh, what time did you have to get up every day to get to school at six forty-five? Or I have to get up at six. Oh, well, that was not too bad. That's pretty fast. You wake up at six. You get、yeah. to school by six forty-five. Yeah, I can. I can like wear my clothes pretty fast, and、uh, directly get on my father's car and eat on my father's car, <laughs> and、uh, put my socks on on my father's car. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. That's talk about streamlined, very mobile. That's great. Okay, so、uh, what about the tests? So it's really controversial, like in the U.S.,、mm -hmm. about standardized tests、mm -hmm. rather than just learning. The students often have to prepare for tests. Yeah. In your country, is there also a big mo movement just to have a lot of testing? We have a test every each month, and we only do paper test. And、uh, mm, the questions can be really difficult. Yeah, always very very difficult.、Uh, in my case, I'm the still I'm I'm the like a middle in the middle middle of the pack as we yeah, say. Yeah, the middle of the pack. And uh, uh, for mathematics, we have totally one hundred fifty scores, and probably I can get sixty to seventy. That's wow. That's, that's a big range of. I mean, do some students get a hundred percent? No. No. If you get more than one hundred and twenty, you are really brilliant. So the questions always really, really difficult. Can the teacher get a hundred and fifty? I'm not sure. Well, I have to admit, because even like English teachers will tell you, and they're lying if they don't admit this. Even on tests like the TOEFL,、mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very hard for a teacher to get a hundred percent. Just not because of Knowledge, but because of concentration. Yes,、right? exactly. We have a lot of questions, and some of them they are kind of tricky. Right. Yeah. And so they mislead you a little bit. Yeah. Oh no, that's great. So you took all these courses. What was you, the course you were best at, and the course you were worst at? Uh, English was my worst at. Oh no, your English is wonderful. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, I disagree. It was. It was. Okay. Well, actually, how how do you learn English in China?、Uh, actually, my speaking skills I get it from my traveling. I did、uh, solo traveling last year. Wow, you've learned a lot quickly. Yeah, thank you. That's great. <laughs> 
That's really that's really inspirational. I think for a lot of the students that listen to this site, one year. Yeah. Fantastic. But、uh, the thing I have to mention about it is, you have to know a lot of words. Before you start speaking English, you have to know what you known. Like、mm. you have to、uh, remember a lot of words, and then you can、uh, use it when you have to use it. Okay.、Mm. Right. So English was tough.、Mm-hmm. Not easy. Not easy. For、well, everything, you have to learn. Learning isn't、uh, easy and、uh, funny stuff for everyone. Starting is hard, and it's kind of betray the human、uh, spirit. Yes. So wow, that's crazy. So how many students would be in an English class? I hear that China has huge English classes. Like there might be a hundred students in one class.、Mm, it can be, uh, but uh, it depends. In my high school, we have the same class at the same classroom. Oh, always. And in my university, we have thirty students in my English. Oh,、class. that's good. That's kind of normal. That's、mm-hmm. still a lot for an English teacher. That's a lot. But、mm-hmm. uh, was your teacher usually Chinese or an international teacher? Chinese teacher. Chinese teacher.、Mm-hmm. Okay. And so there was a big stress on grammar and vocabulary, things like that. Yes. How about listening? Uh, we only do the audio listening test. Okay. So it's、uh, always the same, the same pronunciation, like. Uh, uh, yeah. So you don't have a lot of variety of accents. Yes. Or different ones. Yeah. Okay. Ah, we、well, have to introduce Elo to China. The yeah. Website. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, what was your best subject? My best subject was mathematics. Oh, great.、Mm. Yeah, that's impressive. I have a degree in economics, and、mm-hmm. there's a lot of math. And、mm-hmm. I went to a good school, but I was not strong at math, and I was terrible at physics.、Uh, and so, physics and economics are kind of related, but not really. I did not do very well in physics. So, how how are you at physics?、Uh, I love the, actually, I love all the math stuff.、Uh, Also included physics because you also have to use a lot of mathematics on your physics, and、uh, for the physics、uh, you have to know the、uh, formula very well. Then you can use it. If you don't know the formula very well, you cannot.、Um, when the question is there, you cannot th-、um, apply apply that. Yeah. Oh.、Um, yeah. I, I agree. It's tough. I'm very impressed with you because, whenever I meet somebody who's good at math or physics,、uh, I have great admiration. Because my degree was math heavy,、mm-hmm. but math was not my strong point. So, what was your strong point? Ah,、uh, that's a good question. I was never a good student at anything. <laughs> Uh, I, I went to how I got to a good university is actually surprising, but I was always middle of the road, middle、mm-hmm. of the pack, as we said.、Mm-hmm. Um, always B minus student in everything. I see. Yeah, I was not exceptional like you. You you don't have to be very good at starting, but you can handle your life very easily. That's also an important thing for a human. That is true. I do agree with that, but I think if I was a student in China, I would be that Mister Two Thousand. 